So you can see this truly happened. That was that fateful day in May 2007 when these Ku Klux clowns showed up in Knoxville. They came to play. They came to play. I mean, look at this. They, they uh, used their play and drove the KKK out of town on that day. And I want to ask you, when was the last time you played? Because I am worried about the state of play. Yes, this is one of those sermons that begins with, back in my day, we used to walk to school in 10 feet of snow. <laughs> Because in my day, <laughs> on the sidewalks of Oak Park, Illinois, we used to walk to elementary school in many feet of snow. It's true. We were a gang of seven, my older sisters, my neighbors, and me. In the wintertime, we stopped along the way for snowball fights. In the fall, we jumped into leaf piles on the sidewalk, next to the sidewalks. In the spring, we smelled flowers, played hide and seek, and I spy with my little eye on our way to school. 30 years later, in my neighborhood here in Decatur, I see kids walking to school too. And what do you think they are doing? Largely, they are walking alone, heads down, staring into a smartphone. Now back then, and now, we all got from point A to point B, but back then we got there playing all the way. Another memory of play. I remember as a child going to a restaurant with my siblings, waiting for our table or our food to come out. My eldest sister, Maria, is a master storyteller. My other sister, Kondra, is a master observer. They would watch people, and they would create marvelous stories about them. All their relationships, guessing their relationships to one another, kind of like a judgy guessing game. <laughs> Through their imaginative play and my listening ears, people became fascinating to me, strangers. And to this day, I still play this imagination game as I wait for a table at a restaurant. Now, we all still wait for tables, but instead of playing imagination games while we wait, what do we do? That's right, heads down, staring into a virtual world accessible on our smartphones. This is not a sermon against smartphones, although that might happen <laughs> also. Aside, this is a reminder about the importance of playing. I am worried about recess and how in DeKalb County schools, uh, in DeKalb County schools, the minimum requirement for recess for pre-K students, that's four-year-old students, is 15 minutes per day of free play. I am worried about neighborhoods and the lack of sidewalks and bikes and tag. I'm worried about after school music lessons and dance classes and pee wee soccer practice and all the structure we enforce on our children to keep them busy, safe, skilled, occupied, out of trouble. And there is peer pressure, by the way, I can speak firsthand, there is peer pressure for parents to do this. The horror that my children are not in soccer <laughs> is a surprise to me, <laughs> that horror. But most of all, I am worried about us right here, about how the average American spends 7.5 hours a day looking at screens, even more if they have to write a sermon that <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> Seven and a half hours looking at screens, be they phones, computers, televisions, or tablets, about how leisure, our leisure time has become so sedentary looking at screens. I'm worried as the weight of the world sets in and our dilution, disillusionment with our administration, with our institutions, with our planet's future grows and the furrow in our brow deepens while we will all just become hopeless realists. And we cannot let that happen. Granted, some of those screen hours may be spent on Candy Crush, but I am talking about holy play deep play, 
in real life. The prolific writer Diane Ackerman followed her seminal book, A Natural History of the Senses, with an exploration into the function of play in culture. She writes in her book titled Deep Play. For humans, play is a refuge from ordinary life, a sanctuary of the mind, where one is exempt from life's customs, methods, and decrees. Play always has a sacred space, some version of a playground in which it happens. Now, one way I knew this treehouse space could be our sacred space was a very early Wonderful Wednesday when I noticed Rob and Eva Mitchell, John Johnson, and some other folks playing board games and getting out a deck of cards, playing cards at the tables after Wonderful Wednesday. This'll do, I thought. We can play here. The world of play favors exuberance, license, abandon. Shenanigans are allowed. Strategies can be tried. Selves can be revised. In the self-enclosed world of play, there is no hunger. It is its own goal, which it reaches in a richly satisfying way. As Johann Huizinga notes in his classic text of game theory, Homo Ludens, play creates order, is order. Into an imperfect world and into the confusion of life, play brings temporary, limited perfection. Earlier um, in the first service, when we played rock, paper, scissors, two uh, congregants who did not know each other exclaimed, wanted me to come over, and they exclaimed to me, we just died four times in a row. I mean, we're gonna both change our name to John. We are in sync, we're gonna, we need to work together. I mean, they just met each other. They didn't know each other. One of them was named John. That's why they wanted to both change their name to the same name. Anyway, above all, play requires freedom. Play's rules may be enforced, but it is not like life's other dramas. It happens outside of ordinary life, and it requires freedom. Now, in games and in digital media, game theorists write about a concept known as the magic circle. This is the space where the normal rules and reality of the outside world are suspended, and they are replaced by the artificial reality of the game world. This terminology is mostly related to online gaming worlds, but I am not going to speak much about online gaming worlds this morning, even though I did once lose an entire winter to a beautifully designed Nintendo Quest game called Okami. Have you ever heard of this? It's a beautiful, gorgeous game. It is based on a Shinto sun goddess. But even though I lost an entire winter to that game, when I speak of games here, it will be in the real world, <laughs> not the virtual world. Because I believe that, when, that we create a magic circle when we play. And I look for the places where those lines between worlds can be blurry, where we can travel freely in and out of that magic circle. Huizinga identifies five essential characteristics of play. This is what makes play different from other ways of being. Play is free. It is, in fact, freedom. Play is not ordinary. It is separate from ordinary life. Play is distinct from ordinary life, both as to locality and duration. Again, the sacred playground. Play happens in a sacred place. Play creates order, is order. Play demands order, absolute and supreme. Play is connected with no material interest, and no profit can be gained from it. Now, if you are at wondering about gambling, I would call that a game. And play is a little bit different from a game. So in play, the games change. In a game, the players change. So that's one difference between play and a game. And we're talking about play. And play is deeply central to my ministry. It is important to me. I take play very seriously. I wield it like a tool to unlock something that is stuck to move us all through a plateau 
or to another plane of thought. But play is a muscle. It is one that requires your attention and your engagement, no matter your age. I had the opportunity, while studying worship arts at Union Theological Seminary in New York, to participate in an improvisation class at the Juilliard School. We observed the theater students at the school and the way they, in their improvisation, would create a magic circle, a world within a world, a world with a new reality, with new rules and assumptions. And the more deeply they committed to that world, the better their performance. And the less they observed themselves, the more immersive their commitment became. So I would argue that play requires commitment. You know, I think Don noticed the moment when some of you lost your commitment at the um, rhythm game, at the beginning of the worship. You know, play does require this commitment. Okay, okay, let's keep going, let's keep trying. Even I found myself losing it. Improvisation is transformative play in the theater, which is the sacred playground. I raise this because my seminary was also in the news this past week for a very strange reason. The professor of worship arts, Dr. Claudio Carvales, author of the book Liturgy in Postcolonial Perspectives, led a worship in the chapel in which students confessed their environmental sins to plants that were arranged in the center of the sanctuary. Okay, they laughed in the first service too. Someone at Union Theological Seminary very proudly and perhaps naively tweeted this photo as an example of liturgical in innovation and Breitbart immediately pounced on the image. The right-wing fundamentalist news media is currently right now having a field day with this whole thing which has now been christened Plantgate. <laughs> So if you were to Google Plant Gate, that's my seminary, I'm proud. <laughs> First, there's the offense of worshiping creation rather than God's self. Though obviously confession, I would argue, is not the same as worship. But you must admit, admit there is an aspect of this image that looks absurd and this whole idea. Do we expect plants to talk back? Now this absurdity, it's no accident. Because to know Professor Carvales is to understand the way he views liturgy as radically transgressive, fully belonging to the people. When leading worship, he dresses a little bit like Don did today. He dresses like a street performer, but, the, but one you might see in New Orleans, or a little bit like the Brazilian Willy Wonka. <laughs> the first chapel I ever attended as a worshiper with him, Dr. Carvales as a worship leader, was a Pentecost service. And I remember we were all first murmuring and whispering uh, our praise, praise of love, victory stories. And then suddenly we were louder and then we were leaping and shouting and running in every language, our praise of love, our stories of victory. We were leaping over one another until just at his slight direction, until it became cacophony. And then it became suddenly rhythm. And then suddenly it became a joyful, loud dance out of nowhere. We were dancing and the spirit came alive in us. To experience this worship as a worshiper, was divine. To observe this worship, I'm guessing we looked ridiculous. I mean, absurd. But isn't that true with all ritual? The flower communion, to somebody who does not understand it, may really scratch their heads and wonder, what are we doing? Isn't that true with play? To experience it as divine is freeing. To observe it, absurd. The problem with this photo depicted and shared here, it's not the plants. It's the somber faces that were captured, probably because they were captured in the very moment when the students were facing the truth of human sin against nature, against creation. They were in that moment facing that truth. I believe, knowing this worship space, knowing the worship leader, that the way to this movement moment was paved with whimsy, with a sense of playful freedom, 
though the moment captured was somber. I mean, how else would adults come to take this risk of talking to plants without a serious, within a serious liturgical ritual? The risk comes from the playfulness that got them to this moment. Play is what makes the next world possible, a different world within our world. Play frees us from the chatter in our brain. The absence of mental noise when we are playing is exhilarating, it's soothing, and it's liberating all at once. Diane Ackerman writes, the spirit of deep play is spontaneity, discovery, and being open to new challenges. It encourages growth. A new scheme, thrilling at first, rapidly can become ordinary or dull. I'm bored with this game. Craving moment, more moments of deep play, we then set bigger challenges, develop new skills, take greater chances, canvas new worlds. And we are creating a new world right here within the world of Atlanta. I don't know how else to say it, and we will need everything we have. We will need all of our grit, all of our creativity, our time. We will need our passion, and we will need to be playful. This is how it will be. Without play, this dreaming process of who we are to become in Atlanta, well, it will only be drudgery, intensity, anxiety. There are so many ways to build a dream. I would like to suggest we build, we get there playfully. But we will have to look for those moments for play. They are the stuck moments when we cannot think our way through it. When we find ourselves listing all the reasons why not, that's when it's time to get up and play. So when I think of the Ku Klux Clowns in Knoxville, Tennessee, that May Day in 2007, I imagine all the meetings that led up to that moment of counter-protest, all the plotting, the planning. I imagine there were disagreements in those meetings of tactics. There was struggle. I imagine they were afraid. But the triumph of that moment was creating a magic circle that enfolded the clan. They established a world within a world. They established, they created new rules, and they made the clan their players. This was righteous play. This was a magic circle where hate could not keep playing. Church, too, can be a sacred playground. I invite you to join me in play. I invite you to join each other in play. Look for opportunities, for playfulness, for whimsy to get us where we need to go. Look for opportunities in your life for whimsy to get you where you need to go. We Unitarian Universalists can be a serious people. We really can. And the world we live in wants to take away our recess. They want to take away our holy playtime. But this is a place where we can still play. I am here because I want to play with you, setting bigger challenges, developing new skills, taking greater chances, and imagining new worlds. Without play, we cannot dream. And this is the time to liberate our dreams. So let's get to work and play. <laughs>